Can a Christian have a demon? This question has caused much controversy in the Christian community. But we need to answer it. Can a Christian have a demon? So please follow me to the end of this message. And I will use scripture and personal experiences to support my position. Satan is active. And his activities affect billions of people every day and everywhere around the world. The question is not whether the devil is active or not. The question is how to spot his activities and what to do about them. So I will share five main doorways Satan uses to enter your life. Doorways are legal right. God is just. And in his justice, he is just toward Satan. So there are legal rights that we give to Satan to enter lives. And I'm going to suggest five, five doorways. Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Freedom begins with knowledge. Freedom begins when you, are, you realize you are in bondage. Mm-hmm. That's where your freedom starts. When you realize you are in bondage, your freedom has just started. And that's why we are talking about this subject because if you don't know you are in bondage, you will stay comfortable in your bondage. So the first doorway the enemy uses to enter your life is through curses. A curse is a supernatural influence that inflicts harm on one's life. Mark chapter 7, verse 24 to 30. He got up and departed from there to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know it. But he could not escape notice. Instead, immediately after hearing about him, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth. And she was asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first because it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she replied to him, Lord, even the dogs under the the, the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he told her, because of this reply, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. When she went back to her home, she found her child lying on the bed and the demon was gone. Jesus called this woman a dog. So there are two interpretations to the word dog in this passage. Either Jesus was being rude and xenophobic. No, I'm using the term xenophobic so I don't use racism because I don't know what her race was. But at least I know She was different from Jesus. So xenophobia can work there. The hatred for someone from another group, like someone from another country, that's xenophobia. Either Jesus was being xenophobic and rude, or he meant something else that the woman understood is not an insult to her. So we need to find out. We don't see any other place in the Bible where Jesus rejects someone because she was a woman or she was of a different race. No. The Samaritan woman, she was a Samaritan, but Jesus took time to listen to her. So Jesus is not racist. We can't find another place in the Bible where Jesus says, because you are not a Jew, I'm not giving you this. We don't find that place. So we can't conclude that Jesus was being xenophobic. We need to find now what he meant by the word dog. I'm still troubled by that word. How could Jesus call someone dog and the person was not offended? If I call you dog, I know I'm losing people in the church. (laughs) So let's go there. (laughs) There is no any other place in scripture where Jesus showed any sign of 
xenophobia. But let's find dog in scripture. Philippians 3, 2 says, watch out for the dogs, watch out for the evil workers, watch out for those who mutilate the flesh. Someone else has used dog. Paul is using dogs to mean unbelievers. All those who call themselves Christians or believers and they are not. But it doesn't end there. Revelation chapter 22, 14 to 15 says, blessed are those who watch their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gate. Outside are the dogs. You can tell me that outside they are really barking dogs. That's not what the Bible is saying here. Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderer, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Definitely, this is not your dog you have at home. No, the Bible is talking about those who don't worship God. Those are called dogs. So when Jesus told this woman that deliverance was not for dogs, this woman understood what Jesus meant. Jesus was not saying deliverance is not for animals or for non-Jews It was not a racist language. It was a spiritual language. It was spiritual language. Because you don't worship our God, because you are not one of us spiritually, deliverance is not for you. That's what the Bible says. If it was just a racist comment, then it was a really bad insult from Jesus. But we can see it doesn't match with his character. We don't see any other place in the Bible where Jesus discriminated based on race. And I see people use this scripture to accuse Jesus of racism without understanding the context of the scripture. So let's keep moving. He says, deliverance is food for the children. Who are the children? In Galatians 3, 7, let's hear what Paul says. You know then that those who have faith are Abraham's sons. In Jesus' mind and plan, he never considered the Jews as only because you are Jew to be worthy of God's blessings. He considered those who believe to be worthy of God's blessings. Why I'm saying this? That consistent with Jesus' message. He was very rude to religious leaders. Because according to Jesus, the true children of Abraham were those who believed in him. So faith in Jesus gives you the right to the Abrahamic covenant. Faith in Jesus makes you a child of God. Even when Jesus was on earth, he believed it is faith in God and him that makes one a true child of Abraham. Not because we were born physically from a Jew. That was not Jesus' message. And I'm not dismissing the fact that if you were born Jew, At that time, you had some privileges. I'm not saying that that's not true. No, I'm just saying, if you read the scripture, Jesus was pointing even the Jew towards something. Faith in him. Faith in him. So this woman's humility and faith in Christ gave her the right for deliverance. It was faith that gave this woman access to deliverance. If believers did not need deliverance, why would Jesus suggest that deliverance is for children? I just want you to think about this. This this woman was a Syrophoenician. Who are the Syrophoenicians? Phoenicia was a land in Syria. That's why you see Syrophoenician, people who came from there. Phoenicia was the center of commerce. And there's nothing wrong with being center of commerce. It's good. 
to, to do business. But what they did for wealth was an ab- abomination to God. When the biblical prophets speak of Phoenicia, it's almost always in negative terms. From Elijah in the ninth century to Ezekiel in the sixth century, they all joined in a common critique of Phoenicia. The most dramatic practice of the Phoenicians was the sacrifice of children. They believed Baal was pleased when they sacrificed their children in exchange for wealth. So spiritually, Phoenicians do not only represent commerce, but also satanic practices. The writer of the book of Mark is leading us somewhere. (laughs) Jezebel was from Phoenicia. Mm Mm-hmm. Jezebel was from Phoenicia. God was not against Israelites marrying strangers out of xenophobia. God was not just saying, I'm a racist God. You should not marry that tribe. You should not marry that tribe. No. God was warning them to bring a woman or a man who will bring other God in their faith. It was a spiritual command. Not a cultural command. Not a social command. It was about worship. So God said, do not marry women from outside or men from outside. Phoenician women gave their children to Baal for economic reasons. But this woman came to Jesus for a different reason. To save her child. A Phoenician woman. She wanted her daughter to be delivered. So a few questions arise here. Where did the demon come from? Okay. The Bible is explicit here. It says, little daughter. This was not like the teenager. Little daughter means maybe below 10. We can't say this girl sinned. We can't say that. There's no sin that really a child will commit to deserve a demon to come in their lives. But Mark is pointing us to the origin, to the origin, to birth origin of this lady, Syrophoenician. This was a generational curse. The girl did nothing to deserve it. Someone did it. It came on the girl. Tell me what this girl could have done to bring it on her. The Bible gives us descriptions to show where the demon came from. The mother or the mother's family were were demon worshippers. And they were giving their children to spirit. And finally, their children are being possessed. And the Bible is clear to show us where the demon came from. Some people have demons because of the words or actions of their ancestors. And I'm not saying this to scare you. I'm bringing awareness so you know how to fight. This little girl did nothing, nothing to deserve the trouble. But Satan has no shame. Satan is not fair. He's not a gentleman. He's not. Her ancestors opened the demonic doorway. If one of your ancestors was a demon worshiper, you may carry the curse from their practices. I I just want you to know that. This week, we had a deliverance session in my office. And the demon kept claiming that this person belongs to me. This person belongs to me. And I confronted the demon. I asked, why? The demon said, because they gave it to me. They gave it to me. And I'm like, what happened? The great grandparent sacrificed their family to demonic. And I'm not talking about someone telling me. This is my experience in the office this week. So I'm not coming here to talk about something that a pastor was talking about on YouTube. I'm talking about what I experienced this week. 
You know what? Demons don't die. They just move from, from place to place to from person to person. If your parents were in conflict with someone and that person spoke a curse over them, you may be affected by that curse. Words carry power. If your parents or someone said negative words over you and you believed it, those words can carry a curse over you. You know, you know simple words like, uh, you, you will mount to nothing. Something like that. You will always be in hospital. You know, because you had the cold and the flu and this and then, just your parents will say, ah, you will always be in hospital. Uh, it's not just a word. Mother, you are cursing your children. Oh, people don't like you. Just people don't like you. You know, you people just don't like you. Why say those words to someone? You are opening a doorway for demonic activities. If you believed it, it opened a doorway for the devil to act in your life. Your own words can also open doorways in your life. You can say things like, I'm useless. Poor me. You know English? Never say poor me. Why poor you? Why not reach you? <laughs> oh, I'm good at nothing. You know, people say that over themselves. Those words open a doorway to demonic activities in your life. You know, Satan is not a gentleman, guys. He's looking for an opportunity to enter your life. So when you say those words, you allow him to enter. You open that door. You say, welcome, Satan, and make me poor. Welcome and make me unhappy. Welcome and take me to the hospital. Because that's what you say. You, you confess it with your mouth. You say, oh, I will never be happy. Ah, okay. You open the door. There are Christians who think they can play with fire without being burned. Any dealing with the occult open the doorway to the demonic activities. There are demonic movies that believers watch. They are demonic books Christians read. You should not be reading them. Demonic cartoons that we allow our children to watch with skeleton and scary stuff. Don't think it's just for fun. They are opening doors for in your children's life. And then later your child can't listen anymore. Later your child can't believe in Jesus anymore. Later your child can't do this anymore. And you think, oh, it's just the culture around us. It's not just the culture. Satan has entered your family from a cartoon. Video games. You will see in video games, they show some, 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 some oh, this is how to kill people well. You know, this is how to slay. This is how you slay. Okay. And then they bring scary things and they, they are telling you how to do it. And, and then they bring words. And those words are spells. It's not fun. Video games. I'm not against video games. I'm against satanic video games. Palm reading, fortune telling, horoscope, celebrating a holiday that worships ghosts and witches. You know what I'm talking about. Halo means worship. Ouija board. Dungeons and dragons. Abuse of drugs. It opens doorways in your life. Excessive use of alcohol. Whenever you lose control of yourself, you open a door of the devil in your mind. Oh, why I'm not growing? Why I'm not doing this? Why my marriage is struggling? You've opened the doorway. Close it and you'll see. Hypnosis. I saw a movie there advertising a movie. The title is hypnosis. I'm, t- I'm not watching. Yeah, it's there. It's, it's, uh-huh. I, don't, I don't want to tell you where because I know some of you want to look for it. Uh, no. <laughs> Demonic object. Like, oh, this is for luck. Someone gave you a ring for luck. Someone gave you some stones for luck. Or you went there and they gave you something. Those things are dangerous. Demonic in your house. Stone, charms. And wanted pregnancy. Let me explain this. I think you need to hear this. If your parents didn't want you, they opened a door 
for a spirit of rejection in your life. This is something you will see in people whose parents didn't want. So a pregnancy parent didn't want, and they say things like, oh, I didn't want this child. I really don't. I didn't want this child. When they say they don't want you, someone wants you. They're not giving you to God. They're just rejecting you. And Satan says, oh, I, I, I want her. You will see often people who have a spirit of rejection, they find reasons to leave you. Mm-hmm. They will come to you and say, it's not you. It's just me. I want us to break up. And I'm like, if it's not you, about me, so why are you leaving me? Why are you the one initiating? So it's not about you. It's just me. I just don't feel it's not working. I, I, it's just me. But I'm leaving you. Ah. I still want you. I still love you. But you're telling me it's not me, it's you, and then you are asking to leave. I, I, I was supposed to be the one leaving you. What, what is going on? Spirit of rejection. They always find reasons to leave. They will always make sure people get uncomfortable so they find an excuse to say, they didn't like me. No, it is spirit in you. They don't want to be accepted because, God help us. They will find reasons to leave a church, to leave a job, to leave places because it's a spirit of rejection. They will always feel a question that most ask is, most people ask is that what happened when Jesus comes into one's lives? Aren't all curses broken? I will try to answer that question. Please watch this church, listen to this. Jesus broke all curses on the cross. I declare that, I believe it. Jesus took all our sicknesses on the cross. I declare it, I believe it. Jesus took all our sins on the cross. I declare it, I believe it. You know where I'm going. Why do we still pray for healing? Why do we still have to repent our sins? While well, Jesus is taking it. Uh-huh. This is the point with Christ, with, with what we don't understand with what Jesus did. Jesus made it possible for us. It was impossible before Jesus. He gave us soap and water. He does not wash you by force. People are dirty while water is there. Soap is there. Hot water. Yeah, he has just asked you, repent your sins. Ah, oh, no, no, Jesus has taken my sins on the cross. Okay. <laughs> Salvation is free. Freedom is not. Salvation, by faith, heaven is yours. Freedom to live to the fullest on earth is not free. You have to go through the process called sanctification. The same way you Work through the renewal of your mind, as the Bible says, the same way you have to get rid of all the things the devil has put around you to walk in freedom. Good Christians can struggle with curses because curses don't fall away when you become a Christian. You need to engage in the process of sanctification. Curses should be broken. They don't just fall. They should be broken. And deliverance is for believers. If deliverance was for unbelievers, then there is no reason for Jesus to send his disciples to cast out demons out of people. I will explain why. Listen to this. He could have simply sent them to preach the gospel. And demons would have fallen as people believed. Are you with me? Jesus could have just said, go and preach the gospel. He knows there is power in the gospel to deliver people. So as people believe, demons will be falling. But he said in Mark 16, 17, all these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. Why? Because he knows we need to do it as part of the process. We need to do it. Driving out demons is the authority and mandate for all believers. Jesus also said, if demons leave, they will try to come back. If the house is empty, 
it brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself. Watch this. If deliverance was were for unbelievers, then it would be useless to deliver an unbeliever. Why? It will come back anyway. Now you get my point. If Jesus knew deliverance was just for unbelievers, Christians know once you believe you are free. Ah, okay. So let's separate those two people. All Christian on this side, you have no demon. You are fine. Your life is clear. On this side, we have all the unbelievers full of demons. If we deliver the unbelievers, because that's our mission, Jesus sent us to do it, demons will come back because they will be empty. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that the demons don't come back. So there is no reason to deliver unbelievers because demons will come back. And that's where I see people get it wrong. Oh, deliverance is not for me. And people get ashamed when they, they, you may be feeling something in you. Feel like, I need deliverance. Maybe I need deliverance. I, I can't say this. They will laugh at me. Whoever laughs at you needs deliverance. <laughs> if you shame someone for needing deliverance, you would need it. You are being used by the devil to stop people from finding their freedom. Okay, now let's go quickly. The second thing that you need to watch in your life is trauma. As I said, Satan is not a gentleman. He does not care if you are a victim or the offender. The devil uses your vulnerability as a doorway to enter your life. Abuse can create inner hurt, fear, and bitterness, and that's a doorway. The devil takes advantage of moments of crisis to enter people. Any incident of severe emotional or physical trauma may serve as a temporary breakdown in the defenses, permitting the entrance of demonic spirits. Traumatic events can open a doorway to the devil. That's why forgiveness is an important part of deliverance. You have to forgive. Otherwise, demons will cling to your pain. Third, covenant. Some demons can still be active in your life because of covenant, oath, or pledges made by yourself or your ancestors. If you practiced occultism in any shape or form, you must renounce any covenant you made with the occult. If you practiced false religions, you may be a victim of demonic activities. False religion is any religion that does not confess Jesus as Lord, as Lord and Savior. If any of your parents or grandparents practiced occultism, you could break the power of any covenant they made on your behalf in Jesus' name. Most occultists make covenant on behalf of their families. The fourth one, soul ties. 1 Samuel 18.1 says, when David had finished speaking with Saul, Jonathan was bound to David in close friendship and loved him as much as he loved himself. David and Jonathan had a godly soul tie. It's a positive one. But I just want to use this to show you that you can have a negative soul tie. You can have an ungodly soul tie with someone. And that tie will continue to affect you. The devil will use that tie to stay in your life. So if you see yourself with your ex when you are intimate with your spouse, you need to break the soul tie. You can have an ungodly soul tie with a friend. They own you. You feel that connection in you. You can't get rid of them. In your heart, it, they control your mind. You have a soul tie, my friend. Just a friend. You can have a soul tie with an authority figure. You can have a soul tie with a celebrity. You have photos everywhere. You have pictures everywhere. And you kind of worship them. You can have a soul tie with a celebrity. Be careful. You create an ungodly soul tie whenever you sleep with someone out of marriage. 1 Corinthians 6.16 
Don't you know that anyone joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For scripture says, the two will become one flesh. Every time we sleep with someone, soul tie. A soul tie is created. And we, we, we tell people, we tell young people, and this is even for adults, why go collect and collect and collect and all the curses in people's lives? And, co- and there is grace. There is grace if you live a, a particular kind of life. You come to Jesus, you are saved, you are washed by his blood, you are new. There is grace there. But on purpose, you know the truth and you are doing those things. It's dangerous. The final one is five, ongoing sin. Romans 6.16. Don't you know that if you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. So watch this, church. Paul is writing to Christians in Rome. Okay? Who is he writing to? Christians. Then he says... He tells them that they have the choice to offer themselves as slaves to obedience or to sin. I thought Christians could not become slaves to sin. He's telling them you can become a slave to sin even though, even though you're a Christian. Their faith in Jesus does not remove their freedom to choose right or wrong. They can still choose. If a Christian chooses to commit sin, they are making themselves slaves to that sin. Committing sin includes planning and executing your sin. If a Christian lives in sin by planning and executing sin over and over, they're opening a doorway to demonic activities. It's not just you fall in sin. No, no, we all fall in sin. But if you make it a habit to plan your sin, execute it. Plan your sin, execute it. You are opening a doorway. You are giving Satan a legal right. So these doorways don't go away with time. No, you may forget about them. They don't go away with time. You must close them. So these are three things I want to leave with you. One, stay alert. As Peter recommend, we must be alert and aware of spiritual activities. That's why we are doing this. If you see abnormal patterns in your life, It may be there is a doorway the enemy is using to cause that behavior or that affliction. You've tried medications, counseling, or specialists, but nothing changes. You may be dealing with some demonic forces. And let me be clear, not every challenge in life is demonic. I'm not claiming that. But the Bible is clear about demonic sicknesses and behaviors. So it is in the Bible. Why not try it? Why not fight it? Stay alert. Stay alert. Second thing, stay bold. We must not live in fear. That's what the devil wants. He wants us to start now freaking, freaking, to start now freaking out. He wants you to freak out. He just wants you to live in fear. The devil wants you to be scared. And I think this is why most churches don't address these things. We want to talk about them because we want to deal with them. We are not afraid of the enemy. We have authority in Christ to cast demons out. And the last point is stay free. After repenting, renouncing, doorways, you should stay away from those things. Don't go back there. Remember the enemy is always trying to find a doorway back into your life. Do not go back to places, activities, or relationships that led you to bondage. Stay free. Ephesians 4.27 says, don't give the devil an opportunity. That was a message to Christians. Don't give the devil an opportunity. 